Hey, my name is Brian Bender. I'm a record producer, composer, mixer, multi-hyphenate polyglot. Uh, I've been making records for 20 years. Up for your consideration today is my Ampex 300 series tape machine. This is one of two that I'm aware of in the world. I have owned this for, gosh, going on maybe 11 years. Printed a lot of records through it. In that time, also fully restored it. One recent record that went across this that you may have heard is the Jose James Christmas record. It's, it was the perfect thing for that, like, you know, eggnog with brandy in it type of vibe. This is, you know, of course, the Elvis Sun Studio Slap Echo 2, so I've used it just as the bougiest slap in the world many times. And it's great, but the focus of my work has shifted primarily to film and TV, so a tool like this is underutilized in my life, and hopefully it finds some work in yours. This particular machine was built by a very legendary East Coast analog studio owner. Uh, it was his personal machine. There were two techs that I'm aware of and this, this guy that built it. Uh, but uh, as I'm aware, there are two in this configuration. Uh, this one and then the one that this one inspired who was built by and operated currently by the master engineer Fred Kevorkian. This particular machine started its life as, I believe, a half-inch three-track, as was the, the configuration back then, but it was converted to be a half-inch two-track. So it's actually a modern tape path, and then this particular machine was also modified to have different record EQ cards, and the capstan motor was swapped out so that it runs at modern tape speeds as well. People will be familiar with this particular unit from the modifications. Albini made these real famous, so people will be familiar with this particular electronics. The original owner removed the input and playback, these are alignment knobs, so it's just so tempting to come over and be like, neat, you know? But like I said, I think just for ease of alignment's sake, these need to be manipulated so infrequently that it's like a good protection in the studio to just have the knobs off. <laughs> you could record something on this and have it played back on a Studer 827 vice versa, you know. These machines initially ran at seven and a half and 15 nips, which are not speeds that are still primarily widely utilized today. 15 is still a modern speed, but 30 is what most people like to use as a print down for half inch at this point. And this, this machine does that. So this is the tape transfer speed control. This is a stock function, but on this particular unit, like I said, this is 30 nips and this is 15 nips. So you've got your uh, transport controls, this fun Cadillac, looking flapper is how you change the modes and then these buttons have the same function so play back at 30 ips which like i said there are no as far as i'm aware there's two ampexes that play back and record at 30 ips and in order to change the transfer functions you simply move this chicken head now we're rewinding stop Fast forward, that's it. And then, you know, pop it and play, record, record start. And there's your record indicators. We put new ICO Type 47s in the meters so they look real pretty. All of the input transfer functions work as well, so you can use these as a direct mic amp. If you wanted to do some fucking crazy binaural shit or something like that, you could plug two microphones into this, record stereo and be done. This input transfer is, you know, mic level input, line level input, balanced and line level input unbalanced, which also has a bearing on the way the machine sounds. It just changes the kind of color of it. And then you've got all your transfer functions, right? You got playback, so this is your repro function, record, bias and erase. This is, you know, if you just want to set it to record or print something down, put it in record, hear the tape back, playback, that's it. Record level and playback level are used for the alignment process. There's an MRL included with this machine. And then here's your EQ transfer switches as well. 30 is obviously the aftermarket, 15, seven and a half doesn't do anything at this point. Yeah, in my mind, like I said, the kind of the beauty of this machine is that you get that Motown glow, but it works like a real tape machine. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not like a curio. It's not an antique that doesn't function. Uh, one of the fun original mod, the mods that the original owner also did was that there's a counter, which slightly modifies the tape path in order to make the machine a little bit more stable at 30 ips. So that's kind of a cool feature that none of these Ampexes have. If you're doing punches or whatever, you can reset the counter and then, you know, it follows playback. I had it fully restored. Uh, Ian at Love Magnet went all the way through it. Everything's good to go. It's, uh, it's turnkey.
Yeah, I've printed records to it. Uh, it sounds amazing. It's all of the sort of euphonic benefits of the 351 uh, electronics and the sort of ease of maintenance of a 300 series transport, but also kind of still works in the modern context of studio. And you could send this to a mastering engineer and they could actually deal with it instead of having to deal with seven and a half ips or something, you know. If you've heard any recorded music, you've heard this machine. This is the sound of American recording from the 60s. This is Motown, this is Elvis, this is Sinatra, this is every single one of those records. Then importantly also modernized and brought into a context that makes sense in the, in the modern recording studio, which is I think the real value and its rarity. It's something that connects to the diaspora of music that we've all grown to love, but also is a tool that can still work flawlessly for another 30, 40, 50 years. And then again, like this I sort of feel like is one of those projects where a lot of people have maybe had this idea, but this one exists, this one works, and you can like hit play on it.